Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on Chinese philosophy, Confucianism, and the second uh, most important Confucian after Confucius himself, Mencius. Mensa, Master Men. So, Mencius lived from 370 to around 290 BCE, round the dates off here, um, or the second patriarch of Confucianism. He taught that human nature is good and that we should develop the heart, growing the four virtues through love. Mencius argued that because the human individual is essentially good, we need ritual to guide our growth, culture, lee, education. We need culture, uh, what I was arguing Confucius believes in being most uh, decently conservative over, although there is growth and change continuously in each and every generation, he says. We need culture and tradition to guide our growth, but love is the true essence. I've already explained some of this in the last Confucius lecture as the four chambers of the heart theory, which we have already covered. Um, Sun Tzu, which is Hassan Tzu X U N Z I, not Sun S U N Z I, the master of art and strategy. Sun Tzu lived from 312 to 230, the third patriarch of Confucianism, who was also a legalist, and it's confusing to call who what, argued. Huh. That's like somebody welding outside or something. Or it's like a weed whacker. Anyway, that's amusing. So, Sun Tzu actually argues, whether or not weed whacker, that human nature is evil, uh, and that without the rituals and tradition to hold back what is evil in us, that uh, that is transformed from evil into good through education, we would be selfish and uncivilized. Again, she's wolf girl. She's sexual. She's violent. She's wolf girl. Would we all turn into uh, Freudian girl in the closet wolf girl or not if we do not have culture? Well, Mencius looks at it that human nature is good, culture supports us growing love outward. Sun Tzu says very much human nature is evil, you have to use, and it's very legalistic, and like the legalists thus, harsh punishments, slap it back. That Sun Tzu says, Sun Tzu says that human nature is evil, we're all basically wolf girl deep down, we need culture and clothes to restrain us and to hold us in and hold us back, which are the two sides and remained a major divide and debate in Confucian thought for a very long time. Uh, we can see that there are various views and opinions within the school and that these individuals can draw on Mencius, Sun Tzu, or both to back up their own interpretations. And as usual, in an ethics class, or in any philosophy class, you can really use these perspectives to think a lot about what happens when you go to, well, go anywhere in the car, to the post office, to the store, and what happens there. Because there's a lot of things that are very human, all too human about all of this, and it makes a lot of very interesting issues to talk about. That is the weirdest thing. So anyway, my cats are intrigued. Let's, uh, yes. I have the cats, and they're down here. The cats are basically, like, trying to figure out what the heck that is. So much happiness and a potential weed whacking, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. It's all very good thought for dealing with basic ethics issues, and it's really good Chinese thought 101. The second and third major Confucian, after Confucius says love is at the center, we have to grow it outward, and so do we start off good or evil given that? Well, plenty of both. Confucius definitely says things that support both views, so there you go. Mencius was born in the small, warring state of Zhu, near where Confucius was born and taught. He sometimes is said to have founded Confucianism as an official school, but like with so many cultural movements, there were followers of Confucius who compiled the Analects before Mencius. He was not there at the time and did not claim to be, and certainly there were strands of schools that followed Confucius earlier. Mencius is, of course, the guy who's standing when the dust clears, and of course, you know, history written by the victors and all of that. Mencius gets to be the guy who gets to be the second Confucian, but it is always, as usual, kind of iffy in the middle. Mencius was, however, the primary interpreter of the themes of the Analects for the Confucian tradition that followed. And a thousand years later, with Neo-Confucianism, in the song, Zhu Si taught that Mencius was the last great thinker of the period of the Hundred Schools and the Patriarch of Confucianism, made Mencius one of the four books of Confucian education along with the Analects, 
and those two books of the book of uh, pass, uh, the two books of the book of rights that we already covered: Great Learning and Doctrine of the Mean. And the day I do decide to do the talk with the window open again, somebody decides to yeah, window whack right across, and I don't want to start this talk all the way over again, of course. <sighs> yeah. So, it takes all kinds for, you know, well, again, it takes a village to raise an idiot. So, with all of this, um, we have Confucian education, along with the Analects, is based in the Analects of Confucius, Confucius book, Mencius, the Mencius, Mencius's book, and the book of his talking about things and writing about things. And then you have third and fourth, the uh, short texts from the Book of Rights, the Great Learning and the Doctrine of the Mean. This is possibly calling people idiots as offended the weed whacker. So this is the reason that when the Jesuits got to China 700 years after Zhu Xi and the Neo-Confucian revival, they Latinized Kung Fu Se as Confucius and Men Se as Mencius, but they did not Latinize Sun Se. Who, he did not become Suncius. He could have been, but he's not. Because he, the Jesuits did not actually, because of not only Mencius being somewhat popular along with Sunsa up to Neo-Confucianism, and then the Neo-Confucian, Zhu Xi, the head one guy, he gets to be the one who says, no, it's Mencius and not really Sunsa at all. And then when the Jesuits get there, they also read all these philosophers, and they also somewhat decide, like Zhu Xi, I believe, that... Uh, Mencius, humanity is good, is more like Jesus than Sun Tzu, who is actually uh, known by Jesuits and other early, uh, European scholars, and who mentioned that he is not as awesome as Mencius. And they are following thus the Chinese tradition, and uh, following it as they are taught it in China and by the Chinese, and then as they are Latinizing it and then translating it into European languages, they have definitely followed the model of the Chinese and the Neo-Confucians that Mencius gets to be top dog after Confucius, not Sun Tzu. We're doing this talk here on Mencius. Next talk is on Sun Tzu. Now I even feel bad again for the weed whacker. My heart yet will go on. And again, I just didn't really want to take the time of closing the window, and having to put the cats elsewhere. So yes, we can continue. So the Jesuits the Jesuits did argue that Confucius and Mencius were akin to Christianity. They also believed in the sinful nature of humanity after the fall of Adam, which is weirdly closer a little bit to Sun Tzu. Um, but heck, like Confucius, Mencius' father died when he was very young. Mencius's mother, who was revered as an ideal example of nurturing motherhood, famously moved three times with Mencius, known as Mencius's mother's three moves, which sounds body. And again, I've been listening to Robin Harris, and he is the kind of dozen snap comedian, so we're just going to move on from there, and I'm not going to tell you anything. To ensure that her son would be raised in the right environment, Mencius's mother moves three times. At first, they lived... And I will move on. At first, they lived near a cemetery, but young Mencius began impersonating the funeral mourners who were often paid to pretend to cry and wail. Mourning without grief is one of the things Confucius cannot bear to contemplate. There were probably professional mourners also in Confucius's day. I didn't want to press the point because I don't uh, specifically know that, but I do know that at least by Mencius's time, probably also in Confucius's, there were professional people to cry at funerals. This is known to have been a historical Chinese practice. You pay people to mourn and weep and, like, tear their garments because it's like everybody is... It's putting on a show of everybody freaking out at your funeral. And apparently, you know, it could be seen as a perfectly legit thing to do in profession or not, but this is very bad, according to Confucius, and Mencius's mother was living near there, but young Mencius began impersonating. Notice he is play-acting and acting like the people play-acting, and they're just play-acting to cry. He would pretend to cry like the people pretending to cry and wail, and she didn't want him to think, uh, to be such a way, because she is a very amazing model mother, so she's already got some Confucian, I'm sure, uh, instincts and practices, etc. Dialectical moves. And Confucius, uh, so she moved near a marketplace, but the boy began imitating the cries of the merchants, who were known as swindlers and deceivers. So Confucius was said to have tried being a merchant, but he became disgusted at other merchants who suggested he fix the balances uh, to uh, a little bit cheat a little, to make extra money off of rice, beans, and other goods. 
is said in his legend uh, and story about his stories about his life. Finally, uh, Mencius's mother, which what I'm showing you, of course, is that Mencius's story and his mother's story of his childhood happens to resemble a whole lot of Confucius points very specifically. That's not, of course, is that historical? Is that written in afterwards? Probably a little bit, somewhat of both and all together. That would be what scholars would often say. It's just Mencius happens to be looking here in the way the story is told like the Confucius young dude, you know, or at least he's being set up to be by his amazing mom and obviously doesn't know a dang thing yet. Otherwise, he would not be imitating everybody. But the funny thing is, and this also is almost like a Confucian joke, I have to say at the end, I have to laugh. So the mother doesn't want him imitating the sell of rice for sale, rice for sale. He doesn't. And it's like cheap deal over here on rice. And then like, and, and these people aren't really trustworthy. Funny enough, they're not faking that they have rice like they're faking the cries. It's actually a move on up to the east side because it is kind of somewhat good that these imitating like the merchants, but they're still not good and they still kind of lie, cheat, and steal. So she moved near a university. I live near one, one I went to. So that Mencius would imitate the scholars and teachers, which he continued to do for the rest of his life. Of course, we could see him going blah, 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 expertise, blah, you know, and meow, 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 federal task force, meow. So, and she's like, this is good, you know, <laughs> it's funny, of course, and I do get a laugh out of the classroom a lot because it almost is like a butt on, you know, it's with the uh, sheep, the elephant and the snake falling off the cliff, as I read on the Reddit jokes. But, um, yes, better with the, doom. yes. So with all of that, men just imitates blah, blah, blah scholarship, which for some reason isn't fake, you know, and is genuine product without cheating or something like that. It's implied. But of course, it's kind of like people are used to mocking academics with blah, 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 you know, long winded answers. I have none. All of my points just sail clean home, you know, uh, immediately without dallying into this or that. So it's like him imitating a scholar is almost hilariously like a joke, but no, she thinks that's awesome. So again, maybe that is humorous, and uh, of course, not all scholars, Confucius certainly says, not all scholars are worth listening to at all, especially the ones that are most pompous and noticeable. So Mencius argued that Qi, again, confusingly spelled Q-I in the new opinion system as opposed to the Wade Giles, but at the same time, there's better changes a lot that happened there. Mencius argues chi, cultivated through the body and through moral practice, is uh, and compassion, like any exercise, is good for your health. So he is also mixing this in with a bit of, say, chi, like chi gong and other things, exercises, where it is uh, something... And the Taoists are also into this stuff. In fact, the second and third major Taoists are coming along in the same period, and this is as Lao Tzu is then being formalized and systematized with different systems and practices and things. Now, Mencius's work is actually 1A, 1B, and then a, a colon, and then a number. So in 2A6, and I won't really say the citations much in my spoken talk as I did with Confucius, you can see my notes and find citations. But 2A6, of course, would be, and why is Confucius like 12.6, but Mencius is 2A and then 2B? That's the way historically they collected the work. I'm sure there's people who know very, you know, more specifics about why that. I don't, but I do know, weirdly, there is book 1A and 1B of Mencius, and then that's like, you know, 1 through 30, and then so 2A6 is in book 2A, and then verse aphorism effectively chunk 6. Short chunk on the page 2A6. So it's like paragraph 2A6 or point 2A6, event 2A6. So, yeah, that is the way they decided, much like Luke, you know, our Acts, you know, 317, something or other. So in uh, Mencius states, they've been the same since ancient China. He states in this passage, um, a major thesis of the work. No one is devoid of pat compassion for others. He does say this, which makes us think of, but what about the pure sociopath or something? Or like pure er. Eh, he would basically have to say, and the easy answer here is that person isn't fully human. And that sucks, but that's what he would say. Like anybody who is sort of, it's like that person is a very rare monster. And he would have to admit that, I suppose, if we forced him to, you know, he'd have to be like, well, I guess that person is a very inhuman human then. But that isn't the money. He, he would just, his best argument would be that's like one out of a thousand or something. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe not, you know. How, how was your commute the, today, you know, back and forth. So Mencius argues at several points in the book that we naturally feel for others and their well-being as we do for ourselves. I do think that is decently right. You do see that in humanity. We're not necessarily good with that, but we do 
end up understanding other people's perspectives more than often we let on. And that when we fail to care for others, there are other factors involved that block or reverse our natural compassion. So basically, he would have to say a sociopath has some kind of tumor or something like that, or a physiological disorder, physiomental disorder. And if he said that in your chi and your energy, which is very physical, again, karma and energy and chi and uh, ergon in Greece, these are all much fire and light and physical and things, as well as then we also tend to think of they were a associated with spirits and gods, and then we also tend to make religion and myth and energy like non-physical now in play, and then replace it kind of with a physical physics, but really, of course, this is all the physics of energy and life and the trees, your mind, your heart, etc. So if that energy, which is very much compassion energy stuff of humanity, which flows outward from the heart into humanity, a la Confucius as we talked about, and Mencius is the guy who makes it the fourfold heart as we talked about, that he is giving a lot of examples where he thinks we naturally see us caring for others. If we don't see care, we can explain that as that something is changing that. Mill, the uh, utilitarian, very much like American pragmatism, but in Britain, says, you really by similarity and difference tell if something's the same in all situations, it must be the factors are the same. If something changes, there's a factor that changed. And that's how we should explain things at their most nut and bolt level. And this would basically be that it you see compassion if things are good, and if humanity's thriving, compassion and good naturally flows outward. If something is screwing up, there are factors screwing it up that are blocking that natural progression from happening, he argues. Sun Tzu, as we will see, is very opposed to this. He actually thinks we would continue to go outward and do bad if we weren't reined in by society, which is sort of the other side of the same exact coin, but he actually argues that Mencius is wrong. He says that, you know. So he's like, that guy, wrong, you know, so Mencius by name. So yeah, like we do, he argues, no, Confucius did not argue that. Mencius is a dink. So that is what Mencius argues. Sun Tzu is very imposed to this um, and this interpretation of Confucius. He says compassion has to be specifically developed and, and cooked into human beings. You cannot just assume it's there in the whiny child. This is very much, as I always love mentioning in these points, People will tell you, be like a child and also stop being like a child, of course, right? Because children are magically open and amazing when they're good. And then when children are, of course, whiny and won't stop, they are the worst people ever, kind of. You know, because they're sort of the best unrefined and the worst sort of unrefined, let's just loosely say here, with human emotions, passions, etc. Well, Sun Tzu very much is, Mencius is saying, be like a little child, which is very Jesus-like, and the Jesuits notice that. Sun Tzu is like, have you hung out with little children? They're not educated, and they're not disciplined. They don't know anything. I oftentimes like to bring up here, there is an image, I believe uh, it is, I believe the image was originally shot in Korea, and there is a picture of, uh, the, there was a, there's a video game called Death Stranding, which is a game that, let's just say, confused a lot of people, and a lot of people weren't really sure. It's called Amazing, it's called Not So Amazing, I don't, I'm not getting into it, I haven't played the game. But there's a scene in there where there's a guy crying on a beach, there's a very, a black beach, and it's sort of raining black, weirdly, and kind of alien, kind of, and he's crying, and he's just crying and weeping, and there was a great image somebody took where there's a, what appears to be, tiny little Korean girl, and she is, like, trying to feed him a snack, and she's, like, it's, like, you see this, it's just a still image of, you see his face being, like, like, on the screen, and she's, like, they're like trying in earnestness to like feed him because maybe he's cranky and needs a snack, you know? I mean, so that is adorable and it's an amazing image. I, you know, but, and if I'm wrong and if it's not a, you know, a tiny Korean girl, my apologies, but I do believe it was actually posted and said to be, have been from Korea, you know, where somebody's playing the Japanese video game in Korea that everybody would be playing around the world. And of course she's there trying to feed it, uh, feed the dude a snack. So that is adorable. And of course, uh, mentions would be like, see, huh? And of course, uh, sons of being like, you, you don't parent much, you know, wait two minutes, you know what I mean? And then there will be serious problems in a tiny tempest in a teapot, you know, with, with the sadness, it will be, the roles will be reversed and maybe it'll be his turn to try to give her a snack, you know, but with all of that, of course, you can ask yourself whether children are the pure or are very much the terrible and the horrible. There's a lot of art saying both. Of course, they are weirdly both. This is very much, uh, Sunsa says, Mencius, have you met children? Like you are an idiot. So there's all of that which is kind of awesome. Mencius believes that compassion is like water. Here he actually does use a hydraulic metaphor, as many do. Uh, I do uh, have been mentioning lately, don't go off your meds. But when people say there's a chemical balance in the head, there really isn't so much, as experts have said lately, 
And I do like, we were like, oh yeah, chemical balance. It's like technically there aren't balancing chemicals. Like that's not actually what happens, sort of. Don't go off your, med, you know, or question things in ways I can't and not qualified to. But what I mean is psychologists are sort of saying now, it's not really been a chemical balance. That's just a nice phrase. You know what I mean? I mean, they are testing drugs on the brain. They're not just throwing things blindly into you, you know, or what have you. But they don't really balance anything. You know what I mean? That's not, that's just a nice saying, you know what I mean? Which of course, once you say that, it's kind of dangerous and please again, you know, don't take my medical advice in the slightest, you know, or yes, I did not try psychiatry. That's not my thing or assigning people the pills. No, this is my, uh, this is a bit of my remedy here and we like it just fine. You know, it was before your time for mine too in ancient channers. So both agree that, uh, both Sunsa and Mencius thinking that human nature is kind of love, but you have to reign it, it's good or evil or what have you, has to be transmuted for Sunsa, like a uh, Taoist alchemy. Both agree that when we care for others, we cultivate ourselves and uh, reading the Analects, developing a Confucian point of view, being a wise person, studying hard. Both of these Confucians agree, that's great, that's great, that's great. The problem is, are we taking what we are as the little child and growing it outward for, you know, more so? And, uh, or are we actually turning what is, you know, very horrible and rotten in little children into something entirely different through tempering or change or some kind of alchemy, uh, turning the good bad into good? Freud talks much more like Sun Tzu. I will leave that comparison for Sun Tzu because we're technically just comparing Mencius to him in order to pose off with Mencius here, of course. It's hard to talk about Mencius without counterposing him directly against Sun Tzu, and that is historically what he was. So, he didn't know it at the time, though. Uh, Sun Tzu is just after him. So, Mencius believes that compassion is our nature, and just as water naturally goes downward, Freud uses hydraulic metaphors, the chemical balance. There's a lot of ways where we just use a, uh, water kind of fluid. Well, if it goes in one way, it has to go out another way or something like that. It's just kind of balancing out. The metaphor isn't right or wrong, it's just, it's a nice, convenient, you know, something, it has been called before a hydraulic metaphor. Something like, again, for Freud, you bottle up your drives, they have to be expressed in some other way. Like, if you bottle up sexuality, Freud very much talks as, as I will get with Sun Tzu, if you put on your pants and force your sexuality to, like, hold on, you can go be an accountant and earn money, is like Freud's idea of where society comes from and how men and not women can think and earn money and stuff. It actually does get that simple at that level, which means Freud very much has a kind of hydraulic thing where if you have all this kind of libido energy, and if you don't, if you bottle it up, then you can channel it, like, which is actually kind of what we're talking about. And isn't crazy if we're just talking about energy is kind of like water, it does this, it does that, and you channel energy. Whether or not, you know, I mean, obviously there's people who believe that's more psychic, but actually that's physics plenty, you know. It's also then people may think it's psychic communion or something beyond, say, possibly you, certainly I, myself. But then again, I am feeling psychically that I am laboring the point and, again, uh, stepping too much upon your patience. So, is there a doctor in the house... And again, I have a, uh, yes, doctorate of philosophy, we're all going to die, you know, including this man, is uh, that, yes. So, for Sun Tzu, humans are originally evil and desirous by nature and require society, education, and the exper experience of caring for others to learn to be compassionate. Mencius is famous for using the young child falling into a well. If you enjoy images of children falling into wells, you will love this idea. You're not supposed to, though. That's not compassionate. The young child falling into a well, or almost, let's say, falling into a well, little Jimmy, and it's, uh, what's that, Lassie? You know, is, uh, Mencius, as a young boy, has fallen down a well, you know, his mother doesn't know how to move there, uh, well, you know, we're gonna have to, uh, well, get a rope, you know, we'll, uh, call the Amish and raise a barn, you know, around it or something. So, it's like that Ringu, you know, thing, never mind. Mencius says that we know that we're all not psychotics um, or serious sadists because if a child is about to fall into a well, most human beings would leap up and try to do something. Now, this is certainly, you know, you can be pessimistic here and you can say most people would, I guess, hate it, but watch the kid and fall into the well and not act. Perhaps you could argue he doesn't necessarily say that everyone leaps up and everyone helps, but he does say everyone would feel panic in their heart if they see the child on the edge of the well, which 
is, of course, I'm sort of misspeaking saying they would leap up. If we feel for the child on the edge of the well, this is the example that Mencius is using to convince us we all share emotions and none of us are absolute pure sociopaths, which he may or may not be right about, in my case. What he means, of course, is that if all of us feel a bit for a child in danger, then none of us are, then some of us are maladapted and, and malnourished developed. But that does not mean that makes everybody a bit of the spark of the perfect and the love and the stuff, of course. That is the test. There's your thing on the psychology, you know, self-questioning, self-reporting questionnaire. Yes, I do feel for the child at the edge of the well in this drawing. You know, ding, pick up. So it's a good point for debate, though. I think here, rather than our quibble over the sociopath, we just move on and we say, sure. I mean, you know that's an outlier that could be an exception that you know uh, proves the rule or not let's just call it a wash and say if Mencius is right about most people feeling some panic then our species is naturally empathetic towards children and therefore our species is naturally empathetic and has some compassion at base that is what Mencius is arguing it's not a terrible argument you know it's not even an argument you wouldn't find in a psychology textbook or something like that you know in the beginning you would then hopefully find something like a bunch of studies and other things but anecdotally introducing people to psychological concepts with mencius and the child falling into a well is not a terrible way for introducing a psychology textbook chapter on emotions is it or social you know interaction with emotions or what have you a lot of again the best parts of philosophy are doing the psychology in the ancient times Mencius believe that there are four parts of the heart, I already covered this with Confucius a bit, but I will mention this again, that are developed and cultivated by society and study such that four virtues are grown outward such that the heart is very much like a plant and then grows more energy, blood, life, thriving. I do believe the color red is very much associated in China with fertility, blood, life, virility. Developed and cultivated by society and study such that four virtues are... Uh, the heart is a root system. Looks like a root. Yeah. A knot. The knot of the world for Schopenhauer is the concept of the self uh, carving us off from the world. Rather Upanishadic and Indian. The heart is a root system which grows the virtues of humanity when properly cultivated through education and practice. The four parts of the heart are compassion, ren, which spouts, sprouts benevolence, shame, which sprouts duty and righteousness, courtesy, modesty, which sprouts observance of ritual and principle, and a sense of right and wrong, which sprouts wisdom. Now, in fact, this is an interesting system. I have to say, I'm not the biggest fan of this chopping it up like this, and I am going to make points about that Mencius makes in philosophy. I do not myself personally chase down this part. I was actually told, uh, Shun was uh, the... Professor of, uh, and still is, um, I believe, uh, left for a while, then came back to Berkeley. Um... And Shun is a Menchian, actually, the guy who taught me Chinese philosophy, a decent amount of it, here in this town back in the day, was very, is very much into Mencius and closely reading Mencius. So I would have to better closely read his work more. And in fact, I did, after taking the class, buy his book on Mencius. And I have read parts of his work and such, I will say lovingly. The four parts of the heart are a system which I think is kind of a little esoteric. Sometimes when philosophy and thought and religion get a little bit esoteric and systematic, I sometimes mention all of it, but when Buddhists, like, for instance, like, these 18 things, I will not spend much time necessarily, I will see what I can in it, and then say, they say doctrinally there's these eight things or these 18 things. I don't know if we can break it down exactly into those pieces. And this is one of those moments where there is a lot we will talk about here. Well, a bit with Mencius more. We've already gone a half hour. We have some concepts to cover, but I'm not going to trace all that out for you and just admit I do think that compassion is the root deep down, the inclusiveness. You then have these ways of uh, these three, you know, different ways of things like shame, modesty, and judgment, which then are this sprouting system of making distinctions very much like the heart branches into one collective thing into many different things that are differences and apart. That seems to be the heart model that Mencius was following. He did think it, it seems he does think that it lined up with the four chambers of the heart somehow physically, that it was all real and where energy and blood go through the heart. 
Other than that, I'm not going to systematically chase down how judgment leads to wisdom and modesty is a separate thing that leads to observance of ritual. And that's Mencius' system, and that's mighty fine. I am actually not the, he you know, the Mencius dude. But definitely, given a lecture on him, as well as then Sun Tzu, is important for any East Asian philosophy class, I would say. At least in any East Asian or Chinese philosophy class in which Chinese philosophy features something fierce. So in 3A5, uh, Mencius gets into a battle with a Moist, or at least somebody who seems like a Moist, may not be a, an official Moist, but somebody who would have something like a Moist position. Over, and this is similar, you find in Taoist texts and Buddhist texts, where they're not battling, say, by name this particular school, but it seems like they, were be, they would be battling something which later you would know as a certain sort of position. So we don't know this is a Moist, but he could be. Very well. So Mencius is debating this guy, and while compassion, uh, they are debating over whether one should love one's own family more than others. Now, that is a very central Confucian Moist debate, because the Moist believe that you should be more radically communist, and you should include everybody kind of in your family and love all children as your children and love all dads as your dad, kind of. Mencius, and this is very much actually, Plato wants kind of more of a commune in the Republic, and Aristotle walks it back and says a balance of public and private would be better. Confucius, I do mention, is very much Aristotle to Plato here, is very much Plato to Aristotle, is very much the Moist to the Confucian. The Moist and, the, and Plato want, not even Platonists actually, but want something like a more commune where everything and family are all shared together a lot more. It somewhat weirdly reminds me of the Too Many Cooks kind of video, but I'm not going to get into that. Yeesh. So, with all of that, it's there's a scene in the beginning where there's a surreal... It's a very surreal, like... Um, it's supposed to be like a fake American uh, situational comedy, and it's a bunch of family all hugging themselves. And some, it's a, like the shot where the whole family comes together and, and hugs. It's like, aw, but then family keeps getting added, and it's really surreal. It's like, how much of this family is there? How many husbands and wives? And it's like kind of nauseating how many people are like, aw, and they're all just like hugging each other and way too uh, familiar. And it's kind of, it creeps us out. Worth mentioning just for that point. The uh, Confucians actually say it's unnatural to love all children as you love your children. We should keep it that way. The Moist is like, what kind of jerk are you not trying to love the children more? Somebody love and speak for the children. Hopefully one for the other. You know. So with all of that, you have here that Men is, Mencius is basically going to be looking at this guy and is going to be saying, if this guy is a Moist, and it already sounds like he is thus, this is a head deba the key debate that these guys have. The Mo Moza starts off as a Confucian, and he decides the Confucians are too much into their families and the nobles' families, and he wants more radical communism. I'll talk about that. It's easy. He's not exact. He does, they do not call him a communist. It is easy for me to tell you, Moza wants something like more like communism compared to the Confucians. That's what he kind of wants. He also wants traditional belief in spirits, which is not so much the Soviet Union or modern communism in China or the Soviet Union. But in spite of that, Moza definitely fell out of favor for a whole long time because he was more the radical communist. So that's sort of what this is about. So while compassion is central to Confucianism, whether or not it is innate, like Mencia says, or has to be transplanted and transmuted of the self and desire, like Sun Tzu says, and I'll say next time, Confucians believe that one should have more love for one's parents, children's family, and country, and that this is the natural and proper way for things. It would be natural for me to love America more than China because I'm an American, and it would be natural for a Chinese person to love China more than America, but both should work for world peace. Both should extend a la the great learning outward, everything. However, the greater, wiser perspective, bigger picture, rectifying the heart, world peace. Confucius would say, but properly, we would all work for world peace together. They would also say it's proper to love your family, your kids, what you find familiar, your friends, your country, more than others. That's totally fine and natural. The uh, notice here, he has just, Mencius has just given a fluid model of uh, love going outwards. Something is blocking it. Now, notice, in fact, this is sort of the balance, yes? Because on the one hand, he's like, well, something's blocking compassion if it nat doesn't flow out naturally. But notice, they would he would think Moza or the communists would be trying to flatten things out and push it outward too unnaturally. So now you have the opposite problem, Yes. That's almost like too much love, too many cooks, where it just starts to become, now do you love anybody's kids? Very much, I don't know whether or not, of course, if we have more children in our life, we don't necessarily love them less or ones less. 
It is the weird kind of thing where when talking about love, we are talking about the most important stuff to us. And it can be difficult here to really know exactly what entirely we think. But it can be very safe, I have to say, to stick with Confucius, Mencius, and Aristotle and say, as much as human beings do have drives to be radically egalitarian, I like egalitarianism a lot. It very much defines a whole lot of my, you know, political position. I saw today the joke, it's like, where's your entire personality on this political chart? You know, it's, it doesn't hopefully define my entire personality, but as somebody who loves egalitarianism a lot, I don't know if I want it imposed on people or not at all. And also... I don't know, you know, if Confucius and Aristotle are right or wrong entirely, but they do seem to point out what we often see, which is that people do tend to, you know, care about their familiars more than they do everyone equally, and yet we do love others often as a person and as people, so, and as people at wide, you know, and at large, so... Honestly, I'll let you think for yourself here. In fact, you know, this is uh, this is why this stuff is such interesting good debates. And also, this is going to roll right into Sun Tzu saying, but human nature is evil. So notice all the pieces here. And notice you can debate this stuff as we do, you know, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Because there's all sorts of interesting angles to find here. And there's still relevant problems to us right here and now, of course. So Confucians do believe it's proper to have more love for some than for others. Now, of course, then love is then what draws it all together, also along with the ridges and the curves of it. So Moas, who are radical egalitarians, basically say that the Confucians are being bottled up as Mozo, as Mencius would more the sociopath, of course. They would take Confucian teaching farther, yes? Confucians argue the Moas are breaking with the natural way of the human heart, balancing things out familiar in everyone in society, and the proportion in love is proper and best. <coughs> I don't want to argue hard that it is proper. It is often. Let's just say that, you know. I mean, people do behave that way. And Aristotle, let's not make naturalistic arguments necessarily. But it's hard with Men to say that Mencius and Aristotle did not observe plenty in humanity that isn't radical communism, of course. Or the kibbutz. So... The perfect kibbutz. I don't think that's a band yet, but I don't know. So, Mencius argues that we all do naturally love infants and young children, and that this is good. He returns to his well example. He argues that Yi Tse, a Moist, is taking this one case and applying it improperly to everyone. Notice again, he is aware that the well thing can go too far. Okay, then a child at the well, okay, total communism then. You know, then total love, total inclusion, total breakfast plan. So Mencia says that the Moist wants us to deny our natural gradations of love, which grow in society while affirming that love is the true nature of humanity. Setting love in opposition to itself and making love both natural and unnatural at the same time, oddly. Mencius argues that it is both our nature to love everyone and our nature to love those we are close to more than others, balancing empathy and transformation with duty and tradition. This is the kind of stuff where he technically doesn't say all of what I just said, but this is a legitimate interpretation of the little that he says and people like Shun and others filling in the context with their work, of course, and saying, well, when we read a lot and a lot of stuff at the time, you can clearly see, you know, you can clearly see that Mencius is very much arguing in these ways. And again, if you carefully read the text in good translation, you can see very much what the scholars are talking about. So Mencius argues that love and care for others, this is cool stuff too. A lot of this stuff is cool for like anthropology and like general humanity and interesting deep philosophical issues, of course. Mencius argues love and care for others began with early humanity, living before civilization, seeing the decaying bodies of parents and loved ones being attacked by animals. There are Freudian arguments that actually sound very similar in modern arguments of anthropologists. Uh, a lot of these uh, arguments sound very anthropology-based, that they're observing graves and people and civilizations and saying what they can say about the origins of this or that, which is what people were doing. And there's a lot of folks in China to observe. And a lot of different, you know, factions, civilizations, uh, clans, things going on. So what Mencius argues, with different funeral practices and different burial practices in parts of China, and him hearing about it, that he thinks that people saw their parents' bodies attacked by birds and beasts, and because that bummed them out, because they're like, oh, there's dad getting, like, eaten by the foxes and uh, possibly fox spirits. Because humans care for others, and particularly their parents, Mencius argues, 
Notice this would work both ways, and it does. They were moved at the site to bury the bodies. This is where civilization comes from. This is what Mencius is arguing civilization comes from. That it comes from people getting upset at seeing their parents out decaying in the open, and this is what separates us from the beasts, is actually what he's arguing. That we have this compassion. He may not be arguing beasts don't have compassion, but he is saying that civilization and what distinguishes the human and the humane, the wren, from the animal and from the uncivilized or what have you, civilization itself is caused by compassion for particularly one's parents. Now, Yi Zi kind of agrees to this, it seems, but of course he would, but then of course what would he want? He would want simple state funerals. This is another point between uh, the Moists and the Confucians. Moists want simple state funerals for everyone. The Confucians think it's actually proper to blow a little bit of cash on your folks' funeral and send them off proper and show some respect. The Yi Zi, who could be a Moist, may be saying, you know, that's a waste of money and time. Um, you should just give everybody the civil state funeral, and that's nice, and anything else is wasting stuff in times when people starve. Um, which again, you know, I don't really know if everybody wants the state enforced funeral, especially not in this land of, of here at all, because of course there's a lot of religious factions that would be particularly horrified by any thought of any of that. But, of course, if there's people just decaying in ditches and stuff at the time and people are horrified and there are going to be and are during this warring states period, then guess what? They're seeing a lot of bodies exposed and they're seeing how horribly uncivilized all that is and want to return to a burial of the bodies, of course, as well, you know? And then we know where the bodies are buried. Note that this uh, makes for proper burial. It's the topic of a debate here. And again, we'll see more of that with Mosa. Archaeology today recognizes, of course, in some ways that burial is an early human civilized ritual. Now, that is true. Other anthropologists caution, and it's very good and smart to say, you do know that everything would sort of waste away. We wouldn't really know if people just left people out and they had wooden huts first. The Amazonians, it's like, well, we're just going to bury you in the river. You know what I mean? And then you just go back into stuff. It's the... Effectively, it's not really clear if marked burial sites are always necessary or if, like, you know, burying people with things is always civilization or if people had huts long before that. The reason being, of course, is what you bury in the ground and you try to bury in the ground in specific ways is what's best preserved and you wouldn't see anything otherwise. Everything else would waste away on the surface out exposed plenty. So the problem is, is that knowing that actually you, uh, I would even imagine, of course, digging into the foundations to build dams and houses and huge buildings in ancient China, they ended up unearthing a bunch of uh, graves so they could actually see like archaeologists, of course, as ancient people did and study the world. And we see in Greek philosophy, people saying, hey, look at these shells up here in the mountains. That means something about the water levels and other things. People notice things. They point out, of course, in doing early science, thought, philosophy all over the world. Lots of interesting stuff. He definitely is looking at graves and thinking that's where civilization comes from. Cautiously, yes, still according to anthropology, but remember, you don't even need, uh, cultures can live without having burial sites even, you know what I mean, or just in the river and know, and who is grandpa's grandpa. We don't really know entirely, and that's, that's a living, you know what I mean? I mean, it is what it is. So it's not that burial has to be culture or surviving as a tribe. You could just not have much burial practice as much. Burying you in the river is not letting the birds and beasts eat you right there. There is, I will mention, if you have never heard of, a Tibetan sky burial. A Tibetan sky burial is actually, they expose you. You have possibly seen, probably not the pre the going through of it, but uh, the motions of it, but you may have seen actually something like the bodies. Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. But in Tibetan stuff, they a sky burial is where they actually expose you up on a platform and the, your body, and then basically the vultures take you back to reincarnation effectively. Like, that is a Tibetan sky burial. They basically let the vultures recycle you. Um, and actually, apparently, according, I did see, a, uh, there is a video I watched once, I don't remember, uh, I think I even saw it on YouTube, where there is a guy who's actually sort of shamanic and sort of, I think it's bowl or the Tibetan folk tradition. He's not so Buddhist. And so the Buddhist monks, when they actually want a sky burial, they can't actually, for certain prohibitions, touch corpses or carve up. Uh, they're not supposed to eat meat. And they're also like not supposed to really carve up lots of stuff. So, or touch or be violent. You know, it's like there's special prohibitions of all that. I'm not the expert on. 
So they actually give the guy a bottle of whiskey who's not an official Buddhist, and he gets a bit drunk. He's like, it kind of screws me up every time when I do it. But he cuts up the body a bit so the vultures kind of get a head start and take it away real quick. And he doesn't really enjoy doing that, so they give him a full bottle of whiskey and pay him 50 bucks or something like that every time, which is, as a friend of mine pointed out, this is a little bit like being super Orthodox Jewish and hiring somebody to turn the lights on or off for you because you can't, you know, do it technically yourself. It would be verboten. It's like, technically, that's cheating, and I don't know of an omnipotent being, you know, I'm not going to criticize anybody's thing. Technically, you know, for everybody, it's like there are moments where people try to end run around the cosmos, you know what I mean, with their legalese, which is cute. You know? We do that with all our legalese, but we make run around run arounds of other legalese, of course. I mean, and then, yes, lots of jokes. So, again, ancient lawyers and lawyering in China, please see my school of names and the logician talks about the school of China. I do love that stuff. Again, 99% of a wheel never is touching the ground, then effectively a wheel does not touch the ground. That's right. We just never would say it like that. Chinese lawyer, uh, official, yes, I'm just a simple Chinese lawyer. In Chinese philosophical texts, there are often instances of a famous member of an opposing school conceding an argument to the author of the text, showing us the rich tradition of debate between the various schools of Chinese thought. It does seem that Mencius doesn't get this guy to concede but he has given the majority of the argument in the space to basically show the guy up. So definitely this seems like a Moist being paired or a proto Moist being paired off against Mencius or not. It does seem that way. Quasi Moist, Quasimodo. With Taoism, Confucius is made to accept defeat and concede superiority to the Taoists several times in the text of the Shuangzi, my favorite work of Chinese thought. And, as many a scholar has said, when they tell you Confucius is like, I'm a dumbass, those people are better than me, they probably don't think you're so stupid as to believe them. They are doing uh, what some argue is kind of the first time that's ever been done that much tongue-in-cheek and humor in history. Whether or not this or that is the first time anybody did anything very basic and human, of course, I usually eye roll and describe that. That, you know, that the Taoists are certainly smart enough to know that you know that they know that you know that Confucius wouldn't say, I'm a jerk, the Taoists are better than me. But they say that all the time, and they haven't say that all the time, because ha ha, we're having Confucius here say he's a jerk, you know? And it's like, is that right? Is that right? You know, you were sick this morning? Yeah, it's like, again, yeah, you were sick last night? No, this morning. Oh, this morning. Anyway. The not important. So in 4A12, uh, Mencius says that goodness starts with working on the self and love for your parents and moves outward from there to one's friends and the whole of society. So he agrees with Yi Se, the Moist, that one should cultivate a love for all of humanity, but still thinks it improper to lose all reverence and distinction particular to one's family, friends, and culture. In 4A16, Mencius considers another example famous in, his, in Confucian scholarship for its implications. A scholar, school unknown, poses a problem to Mencius. It says in the laws that it is improper for men and women to touch hands if they are not married. But if your brother's sister is drowning, shouldn't you reach out to save her? Mencius replies that it is proper to save her and that one must not blindly follow the law but use discretion, given the situation. The passage is famous because Confucians are big on observing law and ritual, but sometimes one must break the law. Confucius says in the Analects that even though the rites say to use a silk hat, it is okay to use a hemp hat instead because it is more modest. I do remind everyone in this town that I live in, no, he did not smoke the hemp hat, you know, or advise that. Don't do that. That will not be a fun time. He also tells his students, Confucius does, to rise up and overthrow an unjust tyrant. So that isn't always follow the law or the police. It isn't. So you use discretion. The scholar debating Mencius says the empire is now drowning. Now here's the second move of the one-two punch. Okay, so you save your sister-in-law, right? That wasn't the point, though. The point, obviously, is, okay, let's radically break the laws in the empire and reform stuff during the Warring States period. Now, this sounds like this is probably somebody who has Moist or radical ideas that Mencius does not like, and he is saying, let's radically reform society, right? Let's change the economy entirely. Let's do something else. Now, Mencius, like Confucius, is a bit conservative dad. So does he want radical communism or a bunch of a different economy? No, he does not. So what he says is, Mencius says, no, uh, that uh, he says if the he says we have to use discretion, which is a good one-two punch. So the guy says, 
So never hold, uh, if you do, of course, as I like to say, if I like uh, shake your hand and hold it a little too long, that's creepy no matter who you are. Hands, of course, are very intimate. You know, in fact, even doing like this, it would be hard not to imagine the tactile sensation in your, you know, in your imagination as you see people using their hands and things like that. So you're really not supposed to hold hands uh it is interesting, of course, I come from the Bay Area. Sometimes uh, women, you know, from China will hold hands and walk around together. And, of course, people do assume they're a lesbian couple or something like that. And it's like, well, you're loud and proud, sister. And, of course, that's yeah, not that people are verbally accosting people on the street with accusations of lesbianism. But, yes, we don't need that. The, uh, that essentially what he says is, of course, is that you're not supposed to in China, um, and you're, uh, you bow, so touching hands of people is actually very familiar compared to bowing, and then you also would like, you know, holding a hand of a man or a woman who's not your, you know, it's a little weird, you know, um, uh, a bit. Because, again, and it is assumed to be sexual. Like, if you're a man and you're touching a woman's hand for a while, and we all kind of sort of would in our expectations, assume that sometimes that this may not be just twins or, or sister and brother or something, that it's a little bit more familiar, you know what I mean, than all of that. So... Interestingly enough, of course, he's like, oh, so we never touch women's hands, right? Okay, good. That's the law, right? Okay, unless it's your wife, right? Okay, but your sister's in law is drowning, let her drown. He's like, no. There's exceptions to the rule. So he says, okay, then let's break the laws. But see, that's too far the other direction. So Mencia steers it back, and he says, no, we have to, and he again repeats himself, we have to use discretion. Now notice, love is central, but the choppy parts of the heart up above, and again, is discretion. Channeling this from that, and not this, not that, in, even with all-inclusive kind of love, blood, feeling, and all of, and emotion, and thought, and all of that. So this is, again, during the Warring States period, when people are really wondering how to reform society again, and radical different societies were possible. So Mencius is saying, let's go back very much to tradition and the zoo dynasty. That is what Confucius and Mencius are suggesting. Guess what? They got picked up by the Han, as the Han is saying, guess who is the zoo dynasty? That will be us. Which guy, you know, who has two thumbs? And it is a Chinese dynasty. This guy, you know, I'm Han here, you know, we're going solo. So Mencius is saying, restore the old zoo ways. Turns out that's Han 101 like propaganda. That's what they're doing. That's how they present themselves. So, hey, what do you know? This is some good philosophy stuff to have and put central. So the scholar seems to suggest radical change in social structure, like the Moas argued. Again, as we will soon see, Moas believed that all property should be used in common and everybody lived decently commonly as a family. As with Plato, though, there's details that he doesn't entirely tell us that could change or you know, make or break a lot of that uh, in ways. So in 4b12, Mencius says the great person retains the heart of a child. Amoas might point out the previous battle with Yi Zi and say Mencius is going against what he said before if a child is all uh, loving and completely open. Mencius might counter that retaining the heart, child heart will naturally grow into its arrangements while be being pure and absolute in the same way Children naturally don't love absolutely everybody equally. Children are afraid of people unless they are often, not always, but often, even the crying man on the TV a little bit, but he needs a snack, even if we're afraid of him. You know, snack. The same way children naturally love their parents and those with whom they are familiar. Yes and yes. So uh, Mencius says, following one's parents, I keep trying to cite things and I so told you I wouldn't, so I need to be consistent here. We're being professional. Mencia says that following one's parents when they are alive is good, but following them after they are dead is greater and shows that you are truly cultivated and a noble person. Assuming you have good parents, they're doing good things. If you keep following bad things, that's obviously bad. Sansa might be cynical here, because if you applied this to society, he would argue that without society, one would tend not to be good at all, and that the one who follows the ways of one's parents after they are dead does so only because society still surrounds them with decency and other things like that, even if hopefully they are somewhat transmutated by that point into decent people. Sunzo would likely agree with Mencius, however, that this would demonstrate one was truly cultivated and transformed by society. He would agree with him in that way. So in several places, Mencius likens love and human nature to water and argues just as water naturally moves downward, love naturally moves outward. If water does not move downward, it is blocked. In the same way, if a human being is not loving and compassionate, it is blocked. So Mencius speaks of sowing barley, and this will be uh, 
the final here thing, and what do you think the Jesuits thought of the parable of sowing barley on various ground? Now, I'm going to save Sunsa's uh, reversal of this metaphor. He uses the same metaphor. He uses it ingeniously in a very opposite way than Mencius does, which really shows us a metaphor could, of course, have a very opposite meaning in a very similar, if not identical, situation, and you can interpret it in very radically different ways. I will leave that for the next talk on Sunsa. But in 6A7, I'll cite it one last time here, Mencius speaks of sowing barley on various grounds, strikingly similar to the parable of Jesus, which probably astounded the Jesuits, along with the gold and silver rules of reciprocity of the Neo-Confucians. They distinguish between, in a sense, the gold and the silver rules themselves as two different things, all of one of the same uh, gilded coin. Just as when barley does not grow, the seeds have fallen on bad soil, when humans are bad, it is not because they do not have love and goodness in their nature, but because they are put in a bad situation. Remember Mother Mencius' mother's moves. She kept moving the seed of her son into a better soil and a better environment to cultivate. Reason and goodness are common to all. The sage or great person simply recognizes this and grows what, they all, what everyone has in order to become great. I like that a lot. Sunza is going to remember, remind us that everyone is also one, that everything, again, like the early 90s website, everything is terrible, you know, but that also is very human. And he's going to flip the barley script here, and he's actually going to say something else. But let's, before moving on to him, which we will next here, let's just say that what you can see here is you have the original pure heart of the child, the barley, the stuff, everybody kind of other than the sociopath who has is uh, has a screw loose somewhere uh, or would act like a normal child, let's imagine, sadly. That if you take uh, what Mencius is saying is people are so uniformly kind of the good seed that really when they are bad, it is because they have been thrown into the wrong environment. Now, Sunza actually agrees with this entirely. The guy next here who wasn't Latinized because he's not enough like Jesus, he's a bit more prickly the pair like Schopenhauer, Grandfather Wolverine, is that Sunza is going to say that the barley is actually the good from outside of you, and that we are very much the good or bad like ground, and that flips the figure in ground, something fierce. Um, but it depends on where you see the good coming from as the barley that grows into what and how, of course. So yes... Any who's it's, hopefully you enjoyed all of that. Again, I do love teaching about Confucius and Mencius and Sunsa, as we'll get him next. Because there's such interesting ethical and political issues, you can really teach this stuff in any of a range of philosophy classes. And yeah, hopefully that is more so done. Any who's it's, hopefully all that is prosperous. It is like sowing uh, good barley into your heart, although that would be Sunsa and next, yes. Uh, because it would also be like uh, having your heart, which is pure... And at finding this good, rich soil, let's hope. So, soil aside, and let us not soil ourselves, I will, as always, end this talk here all too quickly and see you if and when I ever see you. <laughs>